Welcome to the Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. That's always interesting, usually funny, and mostly true. I'm Scott Jackson from New Hampshire Outdoor Learning Center. Here are the Fish Nerds. Welcome to the Fish Nerds. This is actually a very special edition of the Fish Nerds. Uh, I wanted to do a series on becoming a fishing guide, and I decided the best way to do it would be to become a guide. So I called Scott Jackson at nhoutdoorlearningcenter.com and asked him, hey, can I do a story on this? And he let me come to guide school and, and record all this audio. So today's very special edition of the Fish Nerds podcast is all about guide school, the first step in becoming a fishing guide. New Hampshire is known for having one of the most rigorous uh, fishing guide tests in the country. I think second to Maine being the hardest. And the reason I went to guide school is I went to the Fishing Game website, New Hampshire Fishing Game, and I checked out what is required to become a fishing guide. So it says applicants must be ready to identify various animals, birds, and fish found in New Hampshire and have general knowledge as it relates to their biology. Other questions will be asked regarding safety, all watercraft regulations, handling of boats, canoes, and kayaks watercraft technology, rescue techniques, aids in navigation, navigation rules, and map and compass. In addition to hunting, in addition, hunting guides applicants must possess a valid hunter safety certification and a current hunting license. Fishing guide applicants utilizing motorized boats require a commercial boat operator's license from Marine Patrol and a current fishing license. I have both of those. The following materials can be utilized as study guides in becoming a licensed New Hampshire guide. These materials should be utilized as reference materials only. <clears throat> and I'll have links to all this on the website. Uh, and I own some of these books. But basically, there are 16 books, sorry, 19 books required to have a full understanding of to pass the guide exam. Uh, and I'll do a quick read through of just some of them uh, New Hampshire Fishing and Hunting Laws, New Hampshire Off Highway Recreational Vehicle Laws, Boater Guides, USDA Guide Permits. Uh, migratory bird regulations, Outsmart, Outback, Fishes of New Hampshire, Peterson's Field Guides, Staying Found, the Complete Map and Compass Handbook, The Essentials, Wilderness Navigator, National Audubon Pocket Guides, Waterfowl Identification, Birds in North America, AMC River Guide, L.O. Bean Canoeing, River Rescue, The Outdoor Leadership Handbook, Be an Expert with Map and Compass, and You Are Alone in the Maine Woods. So that's a lot of stuff. Reading that, I decided there's no question I need to go to guide school. I can't possibly suss it all out. So I asked Scott the question, and he, and he answered it in the beginning class, why does one need to go to guide school? Why does New Hampshire Fish and Game ask you to be a guide? And here's what Scott had to say. So first and foremost, they're interested in knowing that you're going to be safe, your guest is going to be safe, and that it's going to be legal. So abiding by the limits, the law book, and all that, your interpretation of the law book. Look, do they know that people are going to call you after you get a license and ask you about the law and interpreting the law? Absolutely they know. You're considered an expert in your field. If you want to diagnose somebody, you can, you're going to call a, the guy that owns the apple orchard, you're going to call a doctor, right? The guy's a medical professional. Besides conservation officers, who technically knows more about the outdoors than anyone else? Perception is that a guide will know more than everyone else. During class, Scott explained to us why people hire guides. He covered the whole range of why they hire guides, but I think this uh, little bit here is kind of critical. The number one reason folks hire a guide. But yeah, on the species you're after, whatever it is, fish... Believe it or not, it's it's a time money swap. I don't have time to go to New Hampshire and figure out where the jerkies are and where the deer are and where the fish are and what they're biting on and all that stuff. I would rather just give someone little green pieces of paper and have them get the equipment for me, tell me what time to show up, all those things. They just don't have time. They've got money, but they don't have the time to come up and do all the research. So we walked into day one. Now, I was a Cub Scout, Boy Scout, and all that stuff, and I thought I had a good handle on Map and Compass. It took me one minute to realize I knew nothing. Today is all Map and Compass. This will be the first thing they hit you on, the oral board. 
90% of the people get knocked out on map of compass. Everything on these maps and the use of the tools that you have is fair game. They are using the Arrow maps and they're using the Plymouth maps. However, everything that's on those two maps is also on the maps that we, we gave you. <clears throat> we try not to use the same maps that they have. We don't want to we're not trying to replicate the test to that degree. What we're trying to get you to do is really understand all things math and compass. During every part of the class, Scott used great anecdotes and storytelling to explain why it's important to understand these different things. For example, in Map and Compass, he explains what happens when your cell phone GPS isn't quite working right. I get up there and I don't have my compass. I have my GPS for my UTMs and all that, and I have my phone. So I'm like, ah. Android compass and the thing's digital and it's the little number you know it's half degrees and I'm, I hiked the whole thing I was I was like 600 yards off using the Android compass what a horrible deal that is so I thought you know what it was my fault it had to be my fault there's no way I could be that far off so I reverse course I did a back azimuth got to my start point where I knew the corner of the stone wall and I walked back and I was 400 yards off in the other direction. And this, I'm talking precision. Like I was tree to tree to tree within a degree sight line. Nope. Okay. No way am I ever going to use my phone. The trouble with my GPS was that it didn't have the small enough increments. So I'm like five degrees this way and that way, and it looks like you're. So this compass. I ended up coming back here getting my compass and I went up and I shot it within within 10 feet. We spent the entire day one on map and compass. Felt like a good ha had a good handle on it and we let went home. I, I gotta tell you, to be honest, I knew I felt good about it when I left. The next day we came in and my brain had dumped it all out. Really important when you're taking a class like this or you're learning anything new, practice like a maniac constantly. Nice thing about Scott, he was very happy to catch us all up again and get reminded where we left off. Day two was mostly uh, first aid and wildlife stuff. So that felt way more comfortable for me than, than the map and compass stuff on day one. I do know a lot about wildlife and first aid. I'm mediocre with, I have never killed anybody. Scott's style was, was storytelling. So he, he would give us scenarios and we would propose solutions. A really great thing about it is some of our common sense solutions didn't match maybe what the uh, test givers might want you to do. Here's an example. I think I just got stuck in that foot by a bee. What are you going to do as a guide? Ask some questions. Wrong? Lance it. Lance it. Lance it. Lance it. Lance it. Nope. Yes, I got the stand. Absolutely. I'm a little bit of a guy. Nope. Nope. You've done all that before. Maybe. Even better than No. Well, did he step in a nest or was it some long bean that. Ask him if you can. So, none of that matters. What you're going to tell the officer is we're going to immediately end the trip and start walking back toward the truck. Now, if, if you asked, are you allergic? Could he honestly answer and say, no, I'm not allergic? But this time yeah. is the time, and now he goes into anaphylaxis, and I'm. A half a mile from the truck because I wanted to stop and ask him a few questions. So their philosophy on first aid is act and then talk about it later. I actually had a client have a reaction to things one time. It was real scary. Yeah. Uh, Food allergies, same way. Guy's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Been eating them since he was a kid. Next time he eats one, which happens to be with you on a trip, he goes, Not exactly thing, just happened to a friend of mine. But his girlfriend was did the same thing. Eight people raised another sandwich, she's been eating when she's 30. Yeah. All of a sudden, I don't know, he got in the hospital by like the nick of time, said it was the worst case they've ever seen where they actually lived. Yeah. Same thing, like just dragged her into the emergency room. <laughs> yeah. 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 Crazy stuff. So they want you to do what? Air on the side of caution. So those are your key words. I'm going to err on the side of caution. We're going to start walking, immediately start walking back to the truck. If I need medical attention, at least we'll be at the truck. 
right? I can intercept an ambulance. No, I'm not still in the back country wondering, are you allergic? The common answer is, oh, I'm going to watch it. I'll watch it and see if it starts to swell. That's not what they, that's not, that might be reality, but that's not what you need to know and what you need to do. Next question that's very common that we're hearing about is, dad and a 10-year-old son, they get on your boat, first cast of the day, the Rapala minnow treble hook goes right into your ear, right into his ear, the 10-year-old. <clears throat> what are you going to do? Secure the other points. First thing you're going to do is cut the line. Right, so you got to cut the line. Next thing you're going to do is either remove the other hook from the lure or remove the lure from the hook so that you don't cause further injury. Now, a 10-year-old kid is screaming his head off and he's trying to grab it. He's yelling, take it out, take it out. And we hear it all. Oh, I'm going to cut the barb off. I'm going to shove it through backwards. I'm going to put a piece of string on it. I'm going to do, you know, and we're going to, you know, and then we're going to put some neosporin on it, and then we're going to continue fishing. That's not what you're going to do. What you're going to do, once you've secured the remaining hooks, removed them or whatever, you're going to leave the hook in, and you're going to end the trip and get them to the ER and let somebody who knows what they're doing take care of it. Interesting that one guy actually told him, he said, well, here's what I would do. I would clean it, this, that, and everything else. And they were like, that's not the right answer. He goes, no, that is the right answer. The guy goes, you're not a doctor. You can't do this stuff. You're a guy. He goes, in fact, I am a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the testing agents knew that he was the ER doctor in Laconia, and he kept quiet because <laughs> he knew that the guy that was... So there's, there's, like, there's like your map and compass dude, your search and rescue guy, and then there's your officers, and so they're really good at different things. So the, the search and rescue guy who does a lot of first aid was just like, you're not a doctor, you're a guide, you can't be treating patients in the field. He goes, as a matter of fact, and then the other guy's like, oh, I've been waiting for you to do that. <laughs> yeah. That's too funny. He was one of my students. He was pretty clever. So in that, with him being a doctor, he could just do whatever he needed to do. He could do whatever he wants. They ended the first eight questions right there. <laughs> I said, check the boxes. We don't even want to. Why? Because who's going to challenge that guy? Yeah. Right? Uh-uh. So based on your medical training, if you can provide a higher level of care. So once we finish the first aid section on day two, we spent a lot of time on animal identification. So we, we, we dug into fish and fish identification. We dug deep into big game animal biology, upland birds and waterfowl, fur burrs. We even spent time on firearms. And then we got into the meat, uh, the good stuff, the lost person scenario. In order to be a guide in New Hampshire, you have to be able to manage a lost person scenario. So for example, the fish and game officers testing you might tell you, you go fishing with some guy and his family in the woods, the kid goes to collect firewood, he's gone for two hours, doesn't come back, what do you do? And you have to know what to do. Scott ran us through this stuff ad nauseum uh, until we couldn't take it anymore, and then he did it one more time. A piece of a map. I'm going to give you a location of the camp and a location of the truck. And they're going to ask you, in the quick search, how are you going to set that up? Get your pencil, go to the map, and talk it out. Well, let's see. How long have we been gone? Oh, good question. Uh, you've been gone an hour. Okay. So we've been gone an hour. I want to assume Dad's been gone a half hour. Can you make assumptions on this? Yes. Sure. They'll correct you if you're wrong. I'm going to assume he's been gone a half hour. The average person walks between a mile and a mile and a half per hour at night. So I'm going to say, given this scenario here and that we didn't meet him coming this way, that he probably went this way. I'm going to start here, I'm going to establish a handrail, and I'm going to search this area. I'm going to go 15 minutes, 10 minutes, back to the trail, and back this way. Using your pencil. This way. Talk it out. A mile and a half an hour. 
He's been gone a half hour, so he's at least three quarters of a mile, potentially three quarters of a mile away. That's gonna put me here and here and here. I'm gonna take my compass and I'm gonna establish a bearing. After I've established my baseline, I'm gonna establish a bearing and I'm gonna walk on that bearing for 15 minutes and I'm gonna yell the whole time. Ryan! Ryan, can you hear me? Nope, no response. You do the whole search and you end up back at camp. Why do I want to make sure I end up back at camp? He might have come back. Maybe he did go this way and then you walked past him and then he came back. What's mom and the kids doing? What are they doing while they're at camp? Yelling. Right? Pots and pans. You got to give mom and the kids something to do, or they'll sit there and fret about dad. They got to be part of the solution. <laughs> they'll take off. And then they'll oh off. yeah, well you don't want to do that. So you're going to anchor the remaining client. Does that make sense? I'm going to change the scenario on you. You now have three moose hunters at camp. You leave. You come back. You only have two moose hunters now. I think one of the most useful things that Scott did uh, in this whole thing was talk about what to do before you even go on a guided trip. He talked to us a little bit about a pre-trip interview, finding out what our client's expectations are for the trip. For instance, I do a pre-trip interview. This is on the phone with my client. I'm asking about medical conditions, food allergies, expert, you know, what their expertise level is in the field, what kind of hunting have you done before, and so forth. I call it a pre-trip interview. You can call it a phone interview, a first time meeting interview. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it a pre-trip interview if you want. But they need to hear about your pre-trip interview. So pre-trip, medical experience, preferences, I take you ice fishing, what would you like to fish for? Trout, salmon, bass, pickerel, what's your, what's your preference? Uh, pickerel. Pickerel, okay. Really? Pickerel. Call my good friend over here. Pickerel are great. So here's why I ask, because why would I take somebody who wants to go pickerel fishing, trout fishing? I got kind of slow, mundane, but I got fast action, you know, all kinds of stuff, bass, perch, other things going on. They want to know that you're going to listen to the guest and tailor the experience to them. Most importantly, they're going to want to know that you're looking out for their safety. That's why I ask you about medical conditions experience level. Experience level is code for physical fitness. So, have you done much hunting on the side of Kilimanjaro? Oh, oh no, I, oh, I could barely climb up a tree stand. Oh, we might want to put you in a ground line. There's a lot of reasons even beyond the fact that someone's not in good shape that might prohibit them from a tree. This one lady, fantastic hunter, petrified of heights could not on a bet climb up in a tree stand. So did I try to put her on a tree? No, I needed to find that out ahead of time. I don't want her in the parking lot at O dark 30 and I then find out that she's scared of heights. They don't volunteer a lot of this stuff. You gotta kind of drag it out of them. So experience level and then what do you prefer? What kind of hunter are you looking for? Oh, I wanna shoot a 400 pound black bear. I'm not, not your guy. Like, I'm not your trophy hunting guide operation. I'm gonna show you a lot of bears. You might shoot a 400, but I certainly wouldn't. Wouldn't suggest to you that that's a high probability even. You know what he does? He still hires me. I'm the only guy that was honest enough to tell him, I might not be the right person for you. Everyone else was like, yeah, come on over. I got your cover, man. Take your money. So work through the experience. Expectations, right? Somebody told me that yesterday. Managing expectations. This is what you do in your pre-trip interview. 
he then went on to tell us about your uh, your pre-trip briefing. You get together before you go out in the field and you talk to your clients. Here's what we're going to do today. Here's what to expect. Here are the safety. It's called a safety briefing. Now, what might I put in my safety brief? Let's use a fishing scenario. I'm standing on the dock. My boat's ready to go. What do I want to tell someone before they set foot in my boat? No bananas. No bananas. Where the life, okay, here we go. Very easy to remember. Remember the things that you just told me about for commercial boat operations. Where's the fuel shut off? Where's the fire extinguisher? Where's the first aid kit? What's the most dangerous thing on a boat? The propeller in the event you fall out. Absolutely positively stay away from the propeller. What if I fall out? Help me out here. I'm the guy, I got ejected. What would you want to know how to do? How to operate the boat. So turn off the engine. Put it in neutral, right? Oh no! The kid's drifting towards the propeller. Do you think putting it in neutral would be a good thing? You might want to know how to do that. Again, think about the fact that I'm no longer in the boat. You're from New York City. You might want to know, where's the throwable? What, how do we put these life jackets on? What about two-way communications? This is the radio. It's set to the Coast Guard channel. It's very simple. Push the button, turns it on, pick it up, push the button, mayday, 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 give them your location. Does the safety brief from the boating perspective make sense? Anything else? What about a canoe, pretty much? <laughs> right. What if the canoe capsizes? Do I swim for short? No. No, stay with the boat. In the unlikely event we capsize, stay with the boat. If you try to swim for it. You know how many people drown every year thinking that they're closer to shore than they are? But I'm going to go for help. You stay here. No, 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 no. They're paddling across, going to Saki. Cigarette boat goes right over the top. Scott explained to us it didn't matter what kind of fishing we were going to do, fly fishing or ice fishing, whatever. You had to be an expert boater. You had to know all about boat safety. Now, I already have my boater safety, uh, sorry, my, my commercial boater's license. So I thought I'd be great at this. Refreshers are always helpful for me. They likely will be helpful for you. Uh, and they definitely, if you don't know anything about boating safety, before you become a guide, you might want to spend some time digging into those materials. Let's rapid fire that list that you have to commit to memory for the oral work. That's okay. Yep. <laughs> Starting at the front of the boat, what are the, is, begin with me the list of items that are required <coughs> to be on my boat in order for me to operate it commercially. Lights. Co proper lighting. You don't need to say red on the left, green on the right, <coughs> white on the back, visible for one mile. All that stuff was on your written test. You just need to say proper light. Now we move back. What, what is it? Uh, capacity okay, good. Capacity plate. The minute you say capacity plate or data plate, you need to go through the rest of your paperwork. Right? That's like data, other stuff. So I got my data plate. What's on my data plate? Maximum? Capacity. Weight. Capacity. Weight or number of people and then maximum? horsepower and that's going to be located somewhere near the captain what other paperwork do I need to have registration. the boat registration has to be on the boat what other paperwork do I have to have your, license. your commercial boaters license if I'm guiding what other license do I need to have I gotta have my guides license there we've covered the forms or the data we've covered the lighting what do my passengers need to have? PFDs. What kind of PFDs? Type 1. Type one. You have to say type 1 PFDs. You can't say they have to have life jackets. That They won't give you credit for that. Don't make them ask you. You just say type 1 life jackets. Oh, great. If the boat is 16 feet or greater, I have to have what else? 
Take four. Take four throw. What else do I need to have? Fire extinguisher. The minute you say fire extinguisher, what else do you need? Fuel shut off valve. See how things start to trigger each other. What if I got thrown out of the boat? <laughs> you wish you're gonna hope I can swim, right? You have the throwable type four. We just talked about that. Good. What, what's going to happen at this point is once you move away from this, they're going to go into a, your safety briefing. So let's continue with the number of things: oars, fire extinguisher, shut off, whistle, whistle, signaling device. You got it. Anything else? Day two was exhausting. We memorized a ton of stuff. We had a really good time. Learned million things more than our brains can handle afterwards i bumped into two friends who were taking the class with me friends i met at class and we went carp fishing and during the carp fishing trip i asked them what they thought of guide school so far i also should say it was an ill-fated carp trip uh, we didn't catch any fish at all uh, I took him to my super secret, car secret carp spot, and it did not pay off. But we got to hang out and get to know each other and drink a beer. All right, ClayGrossFishNerds.com. We're fresh out of Scott Jackson's uh, class on, uh, what were we doing? What's the class? Guide School? Guide School. And I'm here with Rich Collins, right? Yes, sir. We're from Greenland, New Hampshire. Greenland but and... The Mount Washington Valley and yeah, everywhere in between. Good. Good. Well, welcome. It's good to meet you in person. I've met you online a bunch of times. The power of social. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, what are your... Day two is over. Let's recap day one. What happened on day one in the class? Day one, we played with maps and we played with compasses and we did a lot of things that I never had enough discipline to do myself. Yeah, so. that's, that's my thought, too. Was I've I thought I knew how to use a compass. Turns out I had no clue. On how to use yeah. it. And I learn and then I don't use and then I forget. So full day is pretty heavy action for um, a map and it's a lot of map work. A lot of map work. <laughs> and then today, first half of the day was was all was fish. Yeah, which yeah. I know enough about. So fish wasn't so bad. Warm water I know a little bit less about, but uh, all the different fish species and how they're defined by laws and Interesting to me, uh, to someone who knows all the fish so well in New Hampshire, and you probably sense this too, is how the regs don't always have the names right. And, <laughs> and they use names no one's ever heard of. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, so they were calling whitefish a shad. How do you feel about that? Um, I really have no opinion. Yeah, I have a strong opinion <laughs> about it. I, I want to talk about it. It's problematic for me. But um, it's terrible because they have an adipose fin, and, and they're therefore not... Yeah. yeah, it's all wrong. But that's not Scott's fault. No. And then the second half today was all hunting stuff. So I, yes, on a personal level, I was not listening. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I was just trying to stay awake. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't Scott's fault. It was just something no, I wasn't yeah. into. And so now we are on the Merrimack River in Manchester, off of near the airport, at my super secret carp spot. Oh, yeah, I can't take a picture because we give away the secrets. I'll give you, I, I've given the GPS location to people. I don't care. <laughs> Uh, we're the only ones here, so we're the only ones here. We're fishing for carp. I've got, we stopped at the store to buy bread. They didn't have bread in the store. No worms, <laughs> so I had to buy a hot dog. So I'm using a hot dog bun. Uh, and what are you using? Well, I'm using some kind of paste in a jar. Uh, so, magic biodegradable trout bait. So it's so, green and it's flame squirrel glitter, which has got to be natural. Well, everyone knows uh, that carp like to dance, and I think flamey and squirrely is right on the money for them. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not for human consumption. So unlike the hot dog, we can't. Yes, and I do have a hot dog in my pocket. All the spales, that's going on the hook, and we're going to catch some eel. And there's a so. wood duck, which is a diver, or is it a dipper? It's a wood duck is a, I believe a dipper. I know dipper. it's, I know it's it, it nests in the hollows it of trees. Nests in the hollows of trees. Yeah, that's we learned that today through osmosis, because I was not listening. So, <laughs> but <laughs> that's my fault. <laughs> Good. And the carp are not here yet. We did see a rise. We did chum. We threw a can of corn in the water. We opened the can first. Which we don't know if that's legal or not. It right? is legal. It's okay to chum? Oh, yeah. Chumming is totally good. Yeah. I knew a guy who owned a fly shop in Conway. He doesn't own it anymore, so I can talk about him. This was in in the south of North Conway. So the little fly shop on the south oh, of Conway. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, I know and what you're talking about. <laughs> he used to feed the trout behind his shop yep. every day. He would go out and dump trout, trout, 
chow down there every day. And so his clients went out to fish, they'd walk out his back door, walk the river, and the trout would be sitting there for him. Oh, and he always yeah. invite you to go look at him and yeah. he'd tell you some... But yeah, it was great. But I, I, I fished down there and the trout are, well, swim right between your legs. Not oh yeah, he would go down and snorkel there too. Yeah. He'd invite people to snorkel. Yeah, it was fabulous. <laughs> but it's uh, completely legal. It's totally fine. To Everywhere you can chum. Oh yeah. Glitter. Well, we're, look, we're at the crepuscular time of day. So these, <laughs> I learned that word this weekend. So <laughs> maybe something will happen. You corrected a few words and the... uh, there's a lot of pronunciation issues and some spelling issues. And so uh, one of the things I'm involved in, more or less, um, is in Maine. It's the Audubon Society yeah. doing the Wild Maine Brook Trout Project. I didn't know about that. I know in Conway, Ten Mountains doing it. Okay, well in Maine, the Audubon's got quite a few people, and they're out doing surveys of wild trout where they are where they might exist where they're documented because they don't have the data um, so what's going on over there is there's a lot of ponds especially up north remote ponds there's no regulations on so there's no protection there's harvest you know at will, fish or whatever and is, there's yeah. only i can't remember but there's only a handful or a large handful of places where there's unbred native haven't been mingled with stocked fish and they're unprotected waters so they're trying to put in um, get data on them and then they're going to put in regulations, fly fishing only or no harvest to protect them, so that'll rouse mm -hmm. some locals. Now, do you think fly fishing is more protective of fish than, say, lure fishing only? <laughs> no. <laughs> like, 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 I've always had been one, okay, I get I get that bait fishing, you're going to get a lot more gill hooks and gut hook fish with bait. So I can get behind the, like, no worms in this area. Oh, oh you mean protective of the fish or protective by uh, the fisher? Of the fish. Oh, oh. Look, you, look, you've got line moving out of your pole there. Oh, Did yeah. Did you see that? It might be the tree I'm using. Oh, so we should, I should describe rigger. this. Uh, we, Rich cast an open branch of a tree into the water, and we just uh, we're fishing with an open bale, and we just had some action on his line. His line just ran out like four feet, and so we're hoping a fish is chewing on that bait and is going to pull the line out through the tree. And then we'll have a carp tree. The, the carp will be hanging from the top branches. It's a very it's a very unique setup. It's yeah, my, but it's, uh, uh, it's my branch downrigger. It's a branch uh, strike indicator. It's, uh, branches are nature's bobber, as you know. So, that was that was real movement, though. That wasn't uh, current. That was something real. Except it stopped. Well, maybe they're just sitting there chewing on it, or they spit it out, or they'll come back for it. It was a chub. Yeah. Fall fish, maybe? There's some big fall fish in this river. Could be an eel chewing on it. This big fat American Could be eel. a body rolled on. Could be a body. You never know. There's, you know, there's there's car parts all around us. It could be just a car <laughs> driving by. <laughs> yeah. The mighty mare. Mighty. I love this river. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> it's not even too sarcastic. I really <laughs> genuinely love this there's river. There's insect action. There's always yeah. There's yeah. beaches. Yeah. There's this giant rock pile to fish off, which is super cool. It's super cool. The sun's about to go down. Fish are gonna start biting. We're ready. We've got a tree. Downrigger product. Mm -hmm. God, I'm so excited. Maybe we need to use our golfing voices. And if we catch fish, I'll put a fish nerd sticker on my truck. On the fish. <laughs> we're going to tag the fish with fish nerds tags. Wouldn't that be fun? Is that illegal, tagging fish? Uh, no. It's not going to right time, right? Yep, so you know, we need to make a bunch of fish nerds tags that staple to the... Uh, the dorsal fin. And as we all know in New Hampshire, it's not illegal till someone gets hurt. <laughs> then, then the laws come. Then the laws come. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm here in Manchester with Mason Thagoris, who's taking the guide school with me. Mason, how's it going? <laughs> it's going pretty good here. Um, you know, we're doing some carp fishing, but uh, along with the school um, with Scott Jackson, um, when I first started looking into the, the whole guiding aspect, um, I thought, you know, I'd be able to go right in, ace that test, you know, I thought I knew about fishing and this and that, and uh, doing a little more research, you find out that, you know, you're probably going to fail if you don't end up, you know, in that course, and or, or just having somebody who's going to directly teach you what you need to know. Uh, yeah, I, I'm finding the same thing. I'm shocked at how dumb yeah. I really am. Yeah, I mean, I, I the map and compass, I mean, I mean, I'm sure your brain was as fried as mine was at the end of the day, and uh, yeah, I mean, now I feel like I could find myself just about anywhere maybe back to this fishing spot later on uh, the boy was hard to find they, they, they changed all the roads i can't yeah. find this place anymore but we, we got here and uh today we did fish and hunting are you going to be a hunting guy too or just fishing um i've been swaying uh both ways mm -hmm. um really i was looking towards mostly the fishing and uh 
I feel really confident with with uh, the class that it's going to be a real possibility to hopefully be doing that by the end of this year. So. Yeah, that's where we're going to set the next testing schedule and see how that goes. But we'll follow up later and see. And you're working up in North Country England now too, so I'll yeah, stop in yeah. there and visit you. You know, we'll it's we'll see how really it goes. Exciting. I mean, getting uh, into the shop and meeting all these people who are really. Uh, you know, to me, icons in the fishing industry up up in this area, it's yeah. been a really great experience. Yeah, so. a bunch of real nerds hang out there. So. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah. Day three. Now, day three blew my mind. Turns out <clears throat> the fishing exam is really biased towards the fly fishing world. So we spent all morning going over fly fishing technique and scenarios, and then we had to take the big fly fishing pre-test. And... I am fly fishing stupid. Here's just a little bit of, of some of the Q&A in the classroom. And you'll hear me kind of giggling. I have no idea what people are saying. They might as well be speaking French. I have to learn how to fly fish. The good news is Rich Collins, who you heard earlier, is now a fish nerds correspondent. And he will spend this year teaching me how to fly fish. For the first one, I had double tapered. Uh, five weight floating line. Good. What? Number 24. <laughs> Wait forward, um, six. Wait, go slow. Yep. Wait forward, six sinking. Good. Good. This was the only one I was confused with with the F slash. Shooting taper, eight weight float sink. Intermediate sink. Yeah. I thought it was intermediate, but then the other one below makes it up because I thought that was an I for intermediate or something with the with number oh, six. Oh, is it an L? Is it for level? That's where it probably is. L is for level. Uh, yeah. Okay, number 26. Uh, no, 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 sorry, it's not. No, five weight. Hang on a second. Intermediate sink <laughs> is the I. Because you can't have weight forward five level, right? That's not going to work. Right, right. So it's weight forward five intermediate. The one above it is sinking tip. So the sinking tip and then intermediate sinking. Why would you want to use a fast sinking tip? Fast work. Fast work. Yeah, yeah, fast work. A bunch of these trout, <clears throat> we think of fly fishing on the surface, right? We're always thinking about that dry fly presentation. You know, 90% of the food they eat is, is submerged. It's the little larvae that pop up the pupa and all that pop up off the bottom. And they eat it before it ever gets up there. Well, if you're in a fast water with a deep pool, you can't get down to the fish before the line is already carried down the river. So fast sinking uh, is the key there. Okay, number 27. Double taper. Finally, class, we have four hours left. Scott spent the next four hours just doing oral board practices. We took turns going up in front of the classroom. Scott pretended to be the oral board and just ran the scenarios. So like I said, we all got to take turns. Here's me giving it a go. So, okay, good. All right, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the board. Um, we're gonna ask you a bunch of questions. You know, it, you're gonna start with 100% and then we're gonna work our way back <coughs> from there. We're not here to trick you. We just, you know, we just wanna know does this guy really know his stuff? Would he make a good guy? We're going to start you with some map and compass. We're going to ask you to orient the map. We're going to ask you to do some bearing calculations or do all those kind of things. Then we're going to run you through a few scenarios, just fishing. Yes. Okay. So we'll give you a scenario, you know, an out-of-state guy, blah, 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 license requirements, bag limits. Uh, we'll have you do a safety briefing for us, uh, particularly if you're going to be using a boat. We'd like to know what, what your speech would be to your guests. Then we're going to give you a medical situation, then we're going to go on and do a lost person scenario. Any questions about that? Okay. Okay. So let's assume that you did okay on the map and compass. If, if I did one of these with everybody, we'd be here till Thursday. So I'll just assume you did good on the map and compass. We'll, we're going to go back and do some other stuff later. Thank you. So Clay, there's a big orange life jacket on the left there. Mm -hmm. What type is that? Type 1. And there's another orange one right next to it. That's type two. And what's the difference between the two? Type one is reflective and guaranteed uh, to up to right body in the water. Okay, is there another name for the type one? Probably. 
<laughs> so it's a type one what? A PFD. Type one off. Offshore. Type offshore. one offshore. offshore. And type two inshore. would be an inshore or inland yeah. lakes, bodies of water, smaller lakes. Tell me, what's in your day bag? Uh, first aid kit, change of clothes, uh, flashlights, snacks. I'll forget half of them. No, you're right. Um, see, 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 here's the thing with the list. Did I say map and compass? I said that, didn't I? I don't want to repeat it. Yeah, maybe I should. Write it down. If you're saying M and C, uh, fire starter, FS, knife, K, right, come up with your own deal. Then when the guy goes, yeah, I'm sorry, you didn't say knife. And you go, yeah, I did. And that happened. The last guy goes, who writes it down? One of the guys goes, I'm pretty sure you didn't say fire starter or noise whistling or noise de making device. And the guy goes, idiot, you wrote it down. It's right there. And the guy goes, really? I didn't. Why? They're human. They've already moved on to the question that matters to them. Right. Is this guy going to do well in the bee sting question? Is he going to stop and assess? Or is he going to start walking back to the truck? He's thinking about that while you're answering the question about the fish hook in the ear. Okay, make sense? Yeah. Um, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think I'm nervous. Uh, <laughs> you don't do well under pressure? I, I can. You should. <laughs> I will do. I'm going to practice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't say that you don't do well under pressure. Yeah. They'll send you right out. Yeah. No. Yeah. Noise, noise making device. So whistle. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Let me tell you the points. You can go ahead and write these down if you want. The point related items. Map and compass. Knife. Fire starter. Space blanket. First aid kit. And it can be just one of those little tiny first aid kits. You know, it's got a, a couple of gauze pads and, you know, an aspirin and whatever else in there. These are all items <clears throat> for our, our safety. Your, your day pack. Our day pack for. That, that you item. carry with you by company policy every time you leave the truck. I never leave my truck without my day pack. And they'll say, really, what's in your day pack? Map and compass, fire starter, space blanket, first aid kit, and knife. What about a noise maker? Your truck doesn't and whistle. Count. Your tr whole truck doesn't count as your day pack? Oh, the boating thing. Boating. Yeah, commercial boats. Tell me about operating a commercial boat. What do you need to have and what needs to be on the boat? Uh, so on my boat, um, I need to make sure that there are there are two oars, a nice shot for my fuel, there are proper lighting. Um, you need to make sure that there's a um, the plate that has an occupancy plate. So, uh, type one PFD for all for all of my guests. Uh, I need to make sure when I go through a safety checklist, I show my clients how to turn the boat off and how to put it in neutral and where the anchor is. Had to access all the safety equipment, um, the throttle, turn off. Yeah, you did, yeah, you did say that, so. I wrote down. I can't read your writing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stay away from the. Oh, stay away from the prop, that's right. Yeah, stay away from the prop. Is that a point? It is a point. It's a point. Stay away from the prop. Yep. It's going to make sure all those things are in place. Good. He's combining his boating safety briefing with his commercial boater requirements. Did he miss anything on the commercial boating requirements? Fire Which then triggers you to think about fuel your fuel shutoff. Which you did mention. Good. So think about the hand-in-hand -hand items. Pair them up together. If, if my boat stops at night, what are the two things I really, really want to have? Flashlights and radios. Correct lighting and noise making device. Noise making device. So pair these things up. If my boat stops <coughs> at night, what else might I want? 
All right? Put some feet to these different items, and sometimes it's easier to remember. Um, oh, my registration yep. and my commercial license. And your commercial license. So, so who do you think, if I get stopped by a Marine Patrol, what should I have? Same thing, right? No, that's exactly right. Because that's the inspection. In mentally, in response to the question, what's on your boat? Then just think, okay, I'm going to get stopped by a Marine Patrol. How often does your boat need to be inspected? Every year. Don't say every year. You have to say once per calendar year. Because if you inspect it in June, it's still only good till January. Okay. All right. Um, give me your safety briefing one more time. Sure. Uh, so I bring all my people together and, you know, I'm going to go through all the safety checklists with them. I'm going to take a picture of their boots. And while I'm doing I'm going to take a picture of them too so I can match them in their boots together in case something should happen. We're going to establish. A meeting place if we get lost, if we get on a boat this adventure? Let's talk about the boat safety brief first. Okay, boat safety brief, uh, no force to play on the boat. All the children under 16, but under my company policy, under 18, are wearing life preservers. Oh, no, right. CFDs, if we lost at 16. Um, no horse play, no fire on the boat. Um, I'm going to show them all where all the accessible PFDs are. I'm going to show them all how to turn the boat off. I'm going to show them where the cutoff switch for the fuel is. I'm going to show them where the throttle is, how to put it in neutral, how to put it forward, how to steer it. Beautiful. I'm going to show them where the prop is. And if they fall in the water, I'm going to show them how to avoid it. I fall in the water, and I tell them what to do if I fall off the boat. I'm going to show them where the first aid kit is. Um, and I'm going to make sure that I use the radio, which is dialed right to the Coast Guard station, and click on the help. See, oh, that's how it's done. See how it starts to flow for him? The more he does it, the more he, you two can sit in a room and quiz each other on lost person stuff because it's a very high level series of checklists. Tell me about your safety briefing. Yours won't be like his. He added a few things for his boat deal, but it's fine. He said no horseplay. Absolutely no horseplay. That's a basic boat, boat safety deal. Okay, um, very good, nice job. So, so let's, is there a list of terms that are worth a point for that pre-trip boat safety deal? You said prop. Yeah, fire extinguisher, throttle, key, life jacket location. <coughs> all that stuff is all points. All points. Yep. Shut Caution. Up. Shut up. Caution, <laughs> Will Robinson. Last words. <laughs> you can lose a point by going too deep and not knowing what you're talking about. Yeah. So what? Uh, now you have a guest coming in. Uh, January, I'm going to just keep using the same one because it's always the same. January 10th from out of state. We already know they need an out of state license. Uh, but what are you going to recommend that they bring with them? Where, where are we fishing and where are we fishing? You're going to fish uh, the Winnipesaukee River for trout. For, for trout. So we uh, check the links on that. Um, so Winnipesaukee River opens January 4th. First, it's going to be very cold. We're going to need neoprene waders with felt soles, uh, the belt, and they're going to need, of course, good layers of uh, polypropylene uh, clothing, yes, shade clothes, just in case something should happen. We're going to need a wading stick um, and coffee. <laughs> chest wave. Oh, chest. Oh, a playable, a playable PFD. Good. Thank you. For those of you taking our fishing test, guaranteed you have to say every one of the things he just said. There's a point for each. Yep. Felt sold neoprene chest waders with waiting belt. Waiting staff. Inflatable PFD and change of clothes or warm clothes. Now you could go. Well, he really should bring Snickers versus Kit Kat, right? You can go into all that stuff after the fact, but they'll stop you actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kit Kat, got it. That's, they don't want to know. Once they've checked that box, they just want to move you to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, and then hand you your patch, tell you, great job. They actually give you the patch. Yeah. Like that day, like if you're No, like you have to go down and buy it. <laughs> you're going to carry a piece of paper. Uh -huh. Because you have to buy your license. Remember, you haven't bought your license. 
Okay, good. So we did the boat, we did the safety, we did that, 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 that. Okay, rules and regulations. I'm pretty sure you're good with the rules and regulations, right, Clay? Comfortable. You understand how to read the book. I, read the book. I was going to say, I yeah, hope so. I'm comfortable with, with what yeah, the Yeah, the fish nerd guy didn't know that you couldn't ice fish. <laughs> yeah. um, now, all right, I'm going to give you a lost person. Okay. Um, and then I just want you to help us find them. Okay. Pretty basic, okay? You've got uh, two guys and you're taking up to a remote fish camp. Uh, you do some fly fishing on a, on a mountain stream. Mountain stream. You're walking up the trail to go into this remote place. It's about a mile and a half in. And you turn around and well, actually one of your guests is laying in the trail, unconscious. Okay. What are you going to do? So the guest is laying in the trail. I'm going to first assess the area. Put on my rubber gloves while I'm assessing the area. And then I'm going to check him. I'm going to check to assess him. To see what are you assessing going. for? Be very specific. When I'm assessing the area, I'm assessing for safety. I'm looking around and see if anyone fell on, if anyone might fall on us. Uh, if there's something on the ground near him that I might step on. I'm trying to see what what hurt him so it doesn't hurt me when I'm trying to help him. Uh, and maybe I can ask yeah, you notice a try. bullet hole in his chest. And we're on our way out to go fishing. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to put on my gloves. <laughs> no, you I, are? No, I'm running. I'm running. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so we're on our way. Too late for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I assessed late. the scene and I'm not comfortable with it. Right, so I didn't hear shots. Oh. Uh, so silencers I, are illegal. Silencers, but so uh, did I hear a shot? No. Let so let's go. I'm just being funny. Okay. So let's go back. So he is he is unconscious and he's laying in the chair. I'm conscious. I assess the area. If there's nothing dangerous around him, snakes or anything weird I see, I'm going to I'm going to check him for some sort of danger. I'm going to touch him. I'm going to talk to him and see if I can get him to wake up to assess what where he's at with consciousness. See if I can bring him back. Go ahead. All right. While I'm while I'm doing that, I'm gonna grab my cell phone and, and see if I have cell phone service. Because someone laying out unconscious uh, could be trouble. Is there cell phone services there? Yes. Okay. Good. I'm calling nine one. Did he say ABCs? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Did okay. not say the right, Did not say ABCs? Anymore. So remember, any time um, the guy is unconscious, ABC. So assess the scene. I got the assessment. Put the gloves on, assess the patient, which means ABCs, airways, breathing. Okay. So I'm going to check him Now you need to ask me. me. Now you need to ask me, does he have a pulse or is okay. he breathing? So I'm checking for his airway to make sure it's clear. Um, does he have a pulse? Is there circulation? No. No, there's no circulation. Then I'm going to begin uh, chest compressions. I'm going to start using my, my first aid. Okay. Okay. He's laying in the trail. He is awake, but he's grabbing his ankle and he's screaming in pain. All right, so good. He's awake, screaming in pain. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Well, it's not good. Well, it's good that he's celebrate. Alive. I'm celebrating, not dead anymore. Oh, so I heard him while giving chest compressions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you broke his ankle while doing compressions. All right. So because he's alert and I can talk to him, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna still put on my gloves and assess the area. I'm gonna assess the area. Put on my gloves. I'm gonna ask him. Yeah, I, I stepped on that rock right there and I twisted my ankle okay. bad, like really bad. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check to ensure that his ankle isn't broken. How are you going to do that? Uh, first of all, I'm going to ask him if he can move his move his ankle. I'm going to take his shoe off. He can't. Yeah, he can't move it. He's okay. Gonna so um, goes, you're going to take his shoe off. I'm going to take his shoe off. Uh, I'm going to take a look at his ankle, um, do my best to, to, to sell if it's broken or not. I'm going to move it around a little bit and listen for it. Yeah, hey, it's, it's not broken. It's not broken. Great. And I'm going to hobble him over to the brook. If there's one, yeah, there's one right there. Uh, and we'll put his ankle in the cool water, let it cool down, calm down, and then we assess his ankle and see if we can get him back to the car. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're going to continue. We walk up the trail. Is his ankle uh, better? Yep, his ankle's better. Actually, we hauled him out. We got now you're just yeah. <laughs> Substitute client. Right. So his brother shows up, take his place. So you walk up to the uh, the campsite, and you're in the process of cooking dinner, 
and the guy tells you he wants to go up to a falls. He was here last year with you. He knows this, knows the area. He wants to go up to the first falls and try to catch some fish while you're cooking dinner. Mm -hmm. So the other guy says, "Yeah, I'm going too." So he walks up. They walk up to the falls. About an hour go, goes by, and uh, one guy comes back down to camp, and he's like, "Where's Jack?" What are you gonna say? Uh, first, I'm gonna say, okay, where did you last see Jack? And your last known? He said he was coming back to camp, so he left you at the waterfall, and he went which direction from the waterfall to go? Downstream, right back to the camp. Downstream, and on the map, where's the waterfall? See, immediately start using the map, right? Grab a marker. Um, yeah, yeah, my wilderness guy told me I spent a month scrubbing it up. So. The falls is up here, mm -hmm. and last known location was there. Okay, downstream is in this direction? Yep. Okay, so we're here, and you came down this trail, and you didn't see him on your way no. to me. So it's fair to assume that he went in a different direction. Where the other trail coming off where he started? No, nope. all you see is what you see. All you see, okay. So I'm going to establish a handrail uh, over here. I'm gonna, if he went this way, he probably went the opposite. Direction stuff completely turn around. Well, he might have followed the river. He might have followed the other side of the river down. Thinking, if I keep the river, do you hear him talking it out? If I keep the you river, realize that's what they want to hear. They want to hear this thought process that says, well, he's probably going to go, no, he wouldn't have gone upstream. He's probably going to go down. See the logic start to unfold? Good job. Talking it out. So I'm going to have, I'm going to establish a uh, handrail. The handrail is going to be the river we're on. And then is there any markings over here at all? I don't know. No, no way right. over there, there's a, an old snowmobile trail. So the snowmobile trail is going down here. Yeah. All right, so my handrails are the river that we're on and snowmobile trail, and of course. So what I'm going to do is have my client stay put here, bank pots and pan. We're going to yell first and do a quick search in the immediate area just to make sure he didn't come back, miss camp a little bit. Um, if we don't find him during the quick search, we only have a, a golden hour, so we're going to do that trip quickly. Establish he's not in the region. If he's not, uh, then I'm going to head to the waterfall. I'm going to set my bearings. I'm going to walk over here to my handrail, um, and then I'm going to come down, following my handrail, and then I'm going to turn right back to the river, and then put my white back in that compass bearer in the um, shed. Trip set up here, my red. But uh, and then I'm going to follow back up the whole time, yelling to see if I can establish him within that region, which makes sense when he leaves. There's a fire going. Hopefully, as he's coming down, he's got fire and just be stuck on the other side of the river. Okay, so let me, I'm going to push back on your logic a yeah, little bit. Yeah, go for it. See, and see what, what the rest of the class thinks, whether you like his idea or mine. If I'm at camp on this side and I walk up the stream, mm -hmm. do you think he would have crossed the stream and tried to come back to camp? Probably not. I mean, maybe he did. I mean, if the streams, we don't know how big the stream is. Maybe if the streams, you know, 50 feet across, you're probably not going to walk across. Well, you, so I wouldn't put, do my quick search here. How many of you would do it over here? I probably would have done it on this side. I would have thought he might have tried to take a shortcut or got caught off on one of these arms and ended up down in here somewhere. This is, this is just the way I think. That's Tell great. me if you think I'm wrong. So. My quick search would have started at camp, followed the river up, come across, and then come back to the trail and then back over. That's just, and by the way, I totally made this up just now. I know this is not a scenario I've used before. So that's what I would have done. Now, what did he forget to do, which is what a lot of people forget to do? So I said initial bearing. No. That's going to be a that's one. Sorry, I didn't do right. Worse than that, this is the hardest part of lost persons. Blah, 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 blah. The guy's missing. Oh, Let me back story. you out of the scenario oh, and yeah. tell you about my pre trip interview and my safety brief. You also, at that moment, will tell them what's in your pack. Okay, that's good. So there are three things. Let me tell you about my pre trip interview my day pack, and my safety brief. And the safety brief says, if you get lost, if you get lost, stay where you are, and if there's cell service, call me. 
Okay, have a seat. I was sure sitting there a minute ago, I was not going to forget to do that. So sure. Okay, on your piece of paper, uh -huh. tell me uh, what your, tell me about your preacher interview. With the client. Yeah. I'm on the phone with you. Yeah. On the phone, I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask them about their their, their state of physical health and how active are you. So, uh, also, I'm going to ask them if any health conditions that might make it difficult for them in the woods. Do they have bees in that in that order? Uh, I'm going to ask about their outdoor experience. How much experience have they had in the woods? Uh, on that phone call, I'm going to talk about what kind of clothing they should be packing and bringing with them. Uh, what kind of safety gear they should have in their day pack. Uh, things like basic things like flashlight and uh, first aid kit and that sort of thing. Um, what about expectations? What are your expectations for this trip? The minute you say that, the guys testing you are going to say, there, there's a guy who cares about his client. That's actually a point, but it's it's not a point for a point's sake. It's a point because it really does matter. Hey, this is Frank. I want to take my kid ice fishing next week. Great, Frank. Have you done any ice fishing before? Yeah, back when I was a kid. So what are your expectations for this trip? Are you looking for fast action? Are you looking for, for you know, you're looking for trout salmon? It's a little bit slower, just so you know. No, 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 man, just give me pickerel bass and whatever else, okay? I care about what this guy wants. But I'm really set up for bass, I mean, for salmon and trout. For ice fishing? Better not be. <laughs> okay, um, good. So that's your pre-trip interview. I, I kind of keep it in order so I go medical conditions, food allergies, experience level, and expectations. That's, that's my thing. That's how I say it. We recommend we practice this verbally. Uh, absolutely. Just get it so it's super comfortable and feels good. And this nice. guy right here, I don't want to tell stories on students, but this guy right here that was here on Friday, we sat here and did this, and he did a great job. I know the reason he had a problem on the oil board was he didn't have anybody to practice with. He went home and thought he had it all in his head. When asked to articulate what he was doing, he couldn't get it from here to here. So another guy that was on this other class, his wife could be a guy. She quizzed him in this book. She went through everything. What about medical? What about experience? What about this? What about that? And I'm like, you guys should go get your test, do your test together. He goes, she knows this stuff better than I do. So find someone that has, that you can at least articulate it to. Otherwise, do it in your pickup truck, driving to work or something. You gotta talk it. Maybe record yourself like that. A couple of three or four. Easy for you to say. <laughs> must be podcast over here. Just record yourself. Let's do it. Okay, so good. That's what we're doing now. I'm, I'm gonna play this back and go. Oh god, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, now tell me about your day pack. So my day pack. Um, so my day pack. There is a first aid kit. There is a fire starter. There's my journal that has all my client information, including uh, photos of their boot prints. Uh, and I also take pictures of them while I'm doing the boot prints just in case. I've got a rope, I've got a space blanket, I've got a noisemaker, uh, snacks, and that sort of thing. What else? Um, and a map and a compass. Is that your fire starter? It is mm -hmm. a fire starter and it is a space blanket. So rather than noise making device, say signaling device. Signaling device? Yeah, noise making, that's kind of an odd way. So, or just say whistle. Whistle works. Like a referee whistle. Anybody, anybody ever try to yell for someone when the wind is blowing? It mutes you. Anybody blow a referee whistle? Like a full on NFL referee whistle. Yow! That thing is like, Super loud. So I always recommend that, like those chrome whistle. Man, can you send out a noise? All right. Um, is a knife a point? 
Oh, absolutely. I did not see knife. Oh, you didn't say knife? I wrote it down, I didn't say it. If you don't have someone to practice this with, could you practice writing this stuff down? Sure. Oh, yeah. If you're doing what he's doing all by yourself in your living room, you know, a week from now, it's going to be just as good. To check to see if they have licenses. Yeah. Really? No. Really? You are. No, you are. I like it. You are. You know why? You got to keep records. You have to keep that record of location, fishing license number, name and address, blah, 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 all the area that you fished, species you fished for, that's going to be kept on file for how long? Five years. Five years. I saw that happen. Um, I was a sub permittee, and my permittee purchased a, uh, a guided hunt. So, and it was up in the North Country. And there was another uh, party in camp, and the guy was from England. And he came over, and uh, they took him out, and he hunted for two days. Um, and then this conversation came up about, you know, the cost of licenses and everything else. And he's like, well, you know, this is part of the original submission. He didn't have a hunting license. He only had his tag, which he thought was his hunting license. So they had to call the conservation officer right there, and they were told that, they could lose their tag, but because they did a fait complete and go what? We didn't realize it. He said, okay, we're good, what are you going to do? Now, the guy from England still got a, a $250 fine. This was seven or eight years ago. But they allowed him to continue and... and yeah, and so do they have things. the ability to be reasonable? Not if you're a jerk. <laughs> they seem to lose that ability really fast. But, you know... It's, it's a good idea to like take their license, put it in a ziplock bag for yeah. them, and say this doesn't leave your person. Yeah. That's a, yeah, you have to keep all that stuff on file anyway, so you want to get that ahead of time. We we email out our liability form. At the very bottom of the liability form is the whole thing you need to fill out. So it's all one document. It's got your name, your your address, your hunting license number, and all those things on it. So it just goes in our file. All right. So very good on all that. So now he's still lost. What are you gonna do? All right, so we've done the we've done the quick search. Yep. Uh, and we couldn't find him. You said we have cell phone service. Yes. So uh, I'm gonna I, I called him. I didn't get him. You did the quick search. Then you called him. No, I called him before the quick search. I think. But we didn't get him. I don't right. remember the quick search. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm gonna I'm. What do I call 911 or call the CEO first? Um, it's after hours, you've got to call 911. I'm going to call 911. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to call 911 and. Stand by, sir. I'll put you through the fishing game. Hello, this is Officer Jacobson. How can I help you? Hey, Jack, officer, this is Clay Gross. I'm, you know, guy service, and I have a lost person. Okay. What's going on? Tell me about it. Uh, they were hiking down from from the falls and with a partner, the partner made it back to camp, but they did, they've been gone how long? Uh, about an hour and 20 minutes. An hour, about an hour and 20 minutes, uh, and I need help. Uh, my my car cordage, my UTI, UTI. <laughs> <laughs> my unit bill number is? <laughs> my UTM on my car is, and I'll tell them where the UTM is, and our camp is at this location, okay. UTM. And where are you now? I'm at camp with my clients. Okay. And how far out are you? What is your ETA? Okay, what, what did you tell me about him? Uh, he is otherwise healthy, but he's been lost for over an hour and a half. Okay. You gotta give me the full physical description. Oh, okay. So yeah, he's uh, he's so right it down. <coughs> he is, no, you don't need to give me just just so say okay. height. Yeah. So his height is six foot one. His weight is two hundred and twenty pounds. Uh, he's got no hair. He's wearing a green hat. He's wearing a vest, a red vest. Um, so they won't ask you to make up that stuff. No, they're just, just going to ask you to say. When you say, say physical height. description, say height, weight, what he was wearing, any distinguishing features such as a beard, eye color, okay. tattoos, so you're not presenting stuff. You're just, nope. you're just saying the big categories. Okay, height, weight, yeah. physical features. So what have you done so far? So we've 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 started off at camp yelling for him. Wait, I mean what? How many people are there? Me and then one other his friend. We had two we had two clients out there. One client made it back to camp with oh, me. Okay. 
Uh, so the two of us did a lot of yelling. I kept him at camp making noise. I did a quick search uh, along uh, getting the baron. So you're calling me from camp? Yes. Did you call your client? I did. I did. There was no answer. There was no answer? Right. Okay. I think we asked the movie this. <laughs> Make sure before you call Fish and Game, you call your client. Yeah. Right? What if your battery dies and you missed an opportunity to give the 911? Yeah. You can always go back to your truck and plug in. That's true. Uh, so we did it. I did a quick search with my client, another client you know, making noise. Uh, the the bearing I did the search on, and I'll give the bearing, um, and still no response from the client. Okay. If if we're over here, what's my hand or what's my known handrail? Snowmobile trail. The brook, and then I made one up. We got a snowmobile trail. Yeah, if I'm over here, what are my two known handrails? This one and this one, right? Those are good handrails. That's another reason that logic would say, first of all, we were on this side of the stream to start with. The trail's on this side going up to the falls. I'm probably going to focus on this side, but I have a handrail and I have a handrail. Well, now I'm looking at it. It's also possible that he came back the trail and came back the truck. Yeah, I didn't go he might have gone the wrong way, right? Yeah. Good. So we're just kind of thinking it out. Now, so this is the description. Okay, what else? You're on, on the phone with Fishing Game. Okay, so I haven't heard from him. We haven't found him. Physical description is age, weight, height. Should you give Fishing um, Game his phone number? Yes, sir. Absolutely. So I'll give him the phone number. I'm going to text them. Uh, when we text you a copy of his boot print, please we'll do that. Um, I have a picture of him on my phone, too. I'll send, send it along, too, if you'd like. And then, uh, so, I think I need help. Um, I don't think I need, I need help. So what do you recommend? I, I, well, I recommend we, if you're going to come out and help me, I recommend we start, start a, um, what do we call it, base camp? Staging area. Staging area. Ground my, zero, base camp, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, ground zero at my truck at the trailhead. There's plenty of parking there. Cell phone service is strong. Uh, here's the, the UTM of my truck. Good. And the next thing you're going to ask before you hang up? Uh, what is your ETA? So I'm about two and a half hours away. Two and a half hours, okay. So I've already done the quick search um, using using the, the trail and the, um, the river as my handrails. I'm going to expand that search out towards the truck more in case you hit that trail. I went toward in that direction. And I will meet you back at the truck in two and a half hours. Good. Good job. Anything else? Anything you might have missed? So that's it. That's the end of the day three. Unbelievable amount of stuff we got to know. Scott gives everyone a book. It's like two inches thick of stuff to memorize for the test. I read the whole book. I studied like a maniac. I went to the written test, passed it, no problem. I went to the oral boards, struggled through it. I felt terrible the whole time, but because I worked hard, and studied and went to guide school, I came out with my patch. I am now a licensed guide. So that's it. You too could become a guide. Find out in your area, and I'm sure every state has this. If there's a test to take for becoming a guide, maybe you want to go to guide school first. If you're in New Hampshire or Maine, you can go to New Hampshire or nhoutdoorlearningcenter.com and take one of Scott Jackson's classes. Uh, in addition to this, he also offers classes on wilderness survival and boat safety and uh, mushroom eating and all kinds of cool things. So check it all out. Scott's a great guy, good teacher, uh, and, and what a great place to go and learn some stuff. Part two of Becoming a Fishing Guide is coming out in just a couple of weeks where we look at the business of becoming a guide. We're going to find all about What's involved with opening a guide business, buying insurance, getting clients, making brochures, the whole thing. Everything's learned firsthand through me as I open up my guide service. So uh, it should be a ton of fun. Special thanks to Scott Jackson from NHOutdoorLearningCenter.com. And special thanks to Rich and Mason for uh, being part of this. And of course, my partner Vinny, who's going to be helping out with my guide service this winter. And you can get all this information at FishNerds. Dot com, where I'll link you back to Scott's school. And until next time, uh, you know, 
follow the code of the fish nerds spawn early and often and uh whatever else we do as fish nerds <laughs> have a great day see you guys